Hi, uh, my name's Sid Ballou. I am the new events and programming coordinator here at CLAX. Um, yeah, thank you. I uh, just want to say a quick thank you to everybody for coming out tonight, sharing with all of your friends. Uh, we're very, very excited to have you all here and also to have our wonderful guest, Amber Hollibaugh, who has decided, uh, who's come and um, graced us with her wonderful presence and very excited for the lecture tonight. Um, we will be starting shortly, um, so please feel free to uh, tune in. It will be a lovely night. Thank you so much for coming. Hello. Hi there. Amber. Hi, Amber. Congratulations on the Kessler Award. I met Amber Hollibaugh in the late 70s um, at a gay and lesbian socialist salon that John D'Amelio organized on the Upper West Side. She was visiting uh, New York from San Francisco where she'd been working against the Briggs Initiative and I, my breath was just taken away. Amber in an army jacket and combat boots and just full of so much energy. What Amber's gift to all of us has been that she brings together sex radical politics with class politics, with LGBTQ politics, with anti-racist politics in a way that has helped create a, a political formation that's vital to my political life and has been vital to the best of the queer left um, over the past several decades. I don't know how we would be uh, the best of what we are today without Amber Hollis. Amber, um, over 20 years ago, I walked into your office at the Lesbian AIDS Project because I was looking for femmes, and I was specifically looking for working class femmes of color who didn't take any shit to mentor me as a baby femme. And you did that for me. And in the decades of your life before and since, you, in your unapologetic, fearless, brave even when I know you must have been really scared, willingness to tell the full truth and not simplify it even when it costs you. You have given birth to generations and generations of femme rebels and warriors and organizers and artists and healers. Um, we looked to you when we had few role models for people in the huge universe of feminists. Um, and we respected you because of the way that you dreamed your way home through your storytelling, your art, and your activism. Amber founded the Lesbian AIDS Project. She brought us Queer for Economic Justice. And in her 95 Sex Panic speech, she reminded us that sexuality is an immense place of vision and hope. During Trump times and the mainstreaming of the LGBT movement, Amber brings us back to what is important. She reminds us of our radical roots. Everyone's always told about politics that you have to be practical, but I actually think that's not true. I think you actually have to hold to a dream and then understand what you can realistically execute and what you can move forward and when, but you never give up the dream. Those words are from a 2012 interview that Amber gave with Laura Flanders, and I show that interview to my students every single term for years now. And the students always love when Amber says that. They love much of what Amber says in that video and in the readings that I assign to my students of work that Amber has written. And I uh, picked that quote because to me it represents so much of who Amber is. is um, she is unwilling to compromise on her dream, uh, uh, her dream of what the world should be. And that isn't to say that she doesn't compromise because I've seen her compromise when the situation requires it. I mean, you can't live in this world without compromising, but Amber does it less than most of us do. Uh, I think if she'd been more willing to compromise more often, she'd probably be richer than she is right now. Uh, but Amber has uh, an intellectual and moral integrity that I respect deeply. Um, that 
I've learned so much from. Uh, in the 10 years that I worked with her at NCUJ, she was steadfast in her beliefs and her values and also helped me figure out when and where we should compromise and when and where we shouldn't. And she was a North Star for me uh, about that more times than she knows. So what I, I most remember about Amber and what I always value tremendously is that at a time when her colleagues in the movement, when folks that she had organized with for, for years, um, if not decades, had moved on to play other roles as politicians, as policymakers, as academics, as funders, that Amber was still right there with us, right there with the folks within the LGBT community who had always been seen as disposable, with queer and trans folks of color, immigrants, poor folks, folks living on the streets and in shelters, young people and elders, folks with disabilities, that Amber was right there with us, protesting on the streets, building organizations, building communities, and building movements. And to me, this speaks to Amber's heart, Amber's commitment, Amber's passion, and her roots. When I came to New York City in 1987, one of the first people I met was Amber Hollibaugh, at, at, who was working at the New York City Commission on Human Rights Aid Discrimination Unit. The work of the unit asked the difficult question of whether it was possible to produce progressive media through a city or state funded institution. In 1986, the unit hired lesbian rights activist Amber Hollibaugh with a specific mandate of producing educational video. She worked with two assistants, Taz, ba Taz Brack and Elisa Lebo, and they said, quote, two white lesbians and a black gay man with relatively radical politics were the force behind a video from a city agency. This was state-funded propaganda by people who are marginalized by that very state. We realized what a unique position we were in and tried to make the most of it. In the unit, they ended up making two films, The Second Ep Epidemic, directed by Amber in 1987, a made-for-public television documentary about AIDS discrimination, and then Hard to Get, AIDS Discrimination in the workplace directed by Elise Salibo in 1988. It was really interesting to see what they were doing in that city agency. They were using more money than most of us and they were making city-sponsored health education films with a PBS flair. Nevertheless, hiding a sophisticated AIDS politic and a ra radical cultural politics within uh, city-made work. Um, eventually and quickly, the unit was shut down in 1990 because, quote, they were making too much noise, they were too effective, and they couldn't control us, unquote. At which point, Amber went on to become the director of GMHC's Lesbian AIDS Project. And during that time, she produced the feature documentary, The Heart of the Matter, the first wide release documentary about women and AIDS, which pre premiered on PBS and won the Freedom of Expression Award in 1994 at the Sundance Film Festival. So I hope that um, these contributions are part of the celebration and thank you for everything you've done. Amber, I love you. Um, you are my mentor. You showed me how to do queer work that is that holds a critique, critique about race and class, about um, how queer is always about questioning power structures, about building larger movements for social justice. Yet at the same time, you showed me how to do this work with pleasure and joy and full of passion. When I first read your book, that was for sustenance. Now when I teach your book, and your videos and your talk and your work. What I hope to introduce to my students to is how queer activism is about social justice and at the same time it's about bodies and pleasure.
Thank you all. Um, my name is Rodrigo Brandão, and I'm the co-chair of CLAG's Board of Directors. Um, on behalf of the entire board, I'd like to welcome to the annual Kessler Lecture and Reception honoring Amber Hollibaugh. <laughs> <laughs> and hi, I am Alexis Clements, and I just recently joined the board this year, and I have one order of business and one thought. The order of business is I want to remind everybody that we're live streaming tonight, so it's not just us here in the room. There's also a, hopefully, and I think global audience participating this evening, and if you in the room or out in the ether want to talk about this on social media, make sure to use the Kessler2018 hashtag. So that's the order of business. Um, and the thought is just that as somebody who joined the board um, this year as a non-academic, I was been reflecting on the fact that the Kessler is something I always come to because it's really a place where we celebrate generations, cross-generational conversation. And also for me, it's a place too where we're talking inside and outside of the academy with each other. And I think that's so important and so rich and it's really helped me. Um, so I just think it's worth mentioning that, and then I'm really excited to have all of you here. And I think Rodrigo has a couple more things. Well, thank you. <laughs> yeah, before we get the night started, I'd like to introduce our executive director, Justin T. Brown. Um, Dr. Justin T. Brown, T. Brown is an assistant professor of health sciences at LaGuardia Community College, CUNY, where his teaching primarily centers on courses in public health and human services. Dr. Brown's background mainly resides in the areas of program development and intervention evaluation. His collaborative um, research focuses on addressing health inequities among persons of color, LGBT youth, and those populations at the intersection through asset-based approaches. Prior to CLAGS, Dr. Brown was the deputy director of the CUNY Institute for Health Equity and worked for several years running one of the only national social service agencies dedicated exclusively to working with LGBTQ youth of color. Brown completed his doctoral training with a health concentration in the Critical Social Personality Psychology Program at the CUNY Graduate Center. Please welcome Justin T. Brown. Good evening, everyone. Um, I would also thank you all for uh, once again joining us this evening. And prior to us getting to the, um, the main event and reason why we're here, I just want to give a little bit, uh, again, of a background and reminder of both this award as well as CLAGS. So the Center for LGBTQ Studies, CLAGS, was established 27 years ago by trailblazers at a time when work of a university-based research center solely dedicated focusing on the historical, cultural, and political concerns of the LGBTQIA and continual community was really non-existent. Through the work of CLAG sponsoring public programs, conferences, fellowships, and awards, there's been a strong legacy to preserve the important history of our struggles. CLAGS continues to build upon this work by providing educational opportunities to future generations through a number of different avenues. As part of our awards and fellowships, the Kessler Award is our highest honor, bestowed upon a scholar who through their work has provided significant influence to the field of LGBTQ studies in the larger academy. This year, the board has chosen Amber Hollibaugh as the 2018 Kessler Awardee. Amber's scholarship activism, and intersection of both will be discussed more intimately through the forthcoming testimonials. On behalf of the CLAG's board, staff, and larger community, we want to thank Amber for her dedication to the field of LGBTQ studies, women's studies, and social justice. And I also um, have to mention the, to CLAG's itself for being one of our board members as well. So prior to this evening's lecture, um, we have three testimonial speakers here that will talk about Amber's legacy in more detail. The three testimonial speakers are all community leaders and dedicated their lives to our community through their various crafts. This evening, the first testimonial speaker is John D'Amelio. 
who is an award-winning pioneer in the field of LGBT studies, the history of sexuality, and history of social justice movements. John's a professor emeritus of history and women and gender studies at the University of Illinois at Chicago. John has written and edited numerous works, including Sexual Politics, Sexual Communities, The Making of a Homosexual Minority in the United States. Once again, I want to thank you all for being here, and I introduce John DiMelo. I really just want to stand up here and say, I love you, I love you, I love you, but. <laughs> um, all right, so. Um, <laughs> so, you know, all of you may not know this, but historians love anniversaries. Uh, anniversaries provide us with an excuse to remember, uh, to focus attention on a moment or a time in the past and bring it back to life. Uh, so bearing that in mind, Next year will be the 40th anniversary of my first meeting with Amber <laughs> and <clears throat> the start of our lifelong friendship. I had spent several months in San Francisco in 1979 uh, doing research for what became sexual politics, sexual communities. And my first weekend there, I was on a panel on uh, gay and lesbian history, which is what we called it then, um, organized by the Radical History Network in Berkeley. Uh, events like that were very unusual in 1979. Uh, the discussion was lively. And one of those in the audience was this tall, very imposing blonde uh, named Amber. And we talked. Uh, she told me she worked at Modern Times Bookstore, which was run by a lefty collective, uh, and then I should come by. So, uh, you know, the bookstore was on the edge of the Castro, and a few days later when I walked in, she was at the counter, and as I quickly discovered, she was reading Jeffrey Weeks' pioneering work, Coming Out, uh, which was the first narrative history of LGBT politics that I think any of us had ever encountered. Um, we talked for a bit, but customers kept coming in, so I said, okay, we'll see you again. The following Monday, the verdict came down in the trial of Dan White, for the assassination of Harvey Milk and George Moscone. It was a mockery of justice, uh, the lightest possible sentence for two cold-blooded murders, and the call went out immediately to get to City Hall and you know, demonstrate. Uh, the plaza at the Civic Center was already packed when I got there. Soon, speakers started to address us. Um, uh, there were a lot of them. The two I remember were Sally Gearhart and uh, Harry Britt. But all of them, whatever the particulars of their comments, all of them without exception urged the crowd to stay calm. Harvey would want us to be peaceful, they told us. Uh, we will be honoring his memory and his legacy if we preserve order. And then, this very tall, imposing blonde <laughs> came to the podium. And soon Amber was speaking to us, the words flowing out of her mouth, uh, and her message was quite clear and unvarnished. You have a right to be angry, she shouted. Uh, Where is your anger? Let me see your rage. Uh, and before long, the crowd was exploding, uh, and the glass doors of City Hall were being smashed, uh, and then came that famous moment when a row of police cars went up in flames. Thank you, Amber. <laughs> uh, and, you know, we didn't get to be together that night, but I really, I remember thinking, I love that woman. I mean, she is amazing. I want her in my life. 
Um, and our paths kept crossing that summer. I kept popping into modern times for a few minutes. Uh, the Lesbian and Gay History Project in San Francisco was organizing that summer, and she and I were at planning meetings. Um, the History Project organized a, a, a panel, a public event, on the queer community's relationship with the police, the history of it. Amber and I were on it together. The title of the event was Spontaneous Combustion. <laughs> and especially when Amber was speaking, it felt like the audience of 200 might actually act out the title. <laughs> Finally, after three months of encounters in public meeting, meetings, we managed to have a Saturday breakfast together. So we eat, we talk, we leave, and we keep talking. We walk through the hate all the way to the, task, to the Castro, and we're still talking. We have lunch and talk. We make our way to Dolores Park and talk. We're in the mission, eating our third meal now <laughs> at our favorite Mexican restaurant and talking. We retrace our steps and we end up in front of the apartment where I'm staying and we say goodbye. But we keep talking and Amber is walking backwards down the hill, the physical distance between us growing, but still talking <laughs> until we're finally out of earshot. <laughs> okay, those, I have to say it though, those 10 hours of conversation launched a friendship that has lasted now for 40 years. Um, and I can't imagine my life without it. Um, we overlapped for a few years in New York in the early 1980s, um, and then for a couple of glorious years a decade ago when Amber lived and worked in Chicago. But mostly it's been a long distance relationship where we connected national conferences or when I come back to you know, my hometown of New York City. Through 40 years, our conversation has never ended. Um, that Saturday in San Francisco, one of the main topics was the Briggs Initiative, which the year before had launched the biggest organizing and media campaign that queer folks had ever seen up until that point. Amber told me that day how she made her way through the small communities of Northern California and the Central Valley and how she engaged in conversation with large numbers of individuals who had never met an openly lesbian individual before. Uh, and remember, this is 1978. Uh, and for this guy who at this point had lived his whole life in New York City and had the safety of a large queer community around him, I was awed by the courage and the daring of this really remarkable dyke. We talked about many other things as well, and they're topics that we've never stopped talking about. We talk about the state of the left and its prospects in this ever more conservative political environment. Um, we talk about our movement from the days when it was lesbian and gay to its evolution into LGBTQ and more, and the tendency toward respectability and normalcy that drives both of us crazy. Um, we talk about the increasingly conservative sexual politics of what once called itself a liberation movement. We talk about the class and racial boundaries that some, many of our movement organizations aren't even willing to acknowledge. And through all of these years of conversation, and this you know, is you know, what touches me so much, Amber has forever been the activist translating talk into the work of social justice. Uh, she arrived in New York just as AIDS began to devastate our communities, and as we heard, uh, she plunged into the fight against, against it, working for the Human Rights Commission, combating AIDS discrimination. Uh, later for the gay men's health crisis where she created the first lesbian AIDS project. And I think at the very least, she needs to be remembered forever for coining the phrase, lesbianism is not a condom. Uh, <laughs> She was, she was a staffer at NGLTF for several years, a presence at its annual Creating Change conference. She pioneered in queer aging issues at the Howard Brown Health Center in Chicago. Uh, for years, she was the director of QEJ, 
uh, one of the few LGBTQ organizations that really demanded that our movement and communities recognize how class oppression was destroying the lives of so many queer folks. And she, to finish up, she has managed in her activism, no matter who she might be working for, to say, and I quote here, to say out loud what everyone has agreed not to notice. She's always asking, quote, whose gay battles to survive will be remembered and prioritized? She is constantly calling for, in her words, a new revolution that includes the sexual desires that so many people of whatever identity experience with shame and feel forced to keep secret. She insists that we all, and again a quote, fight for a world in which, for a world which values human sexual possibility without extracting a terrible human price. And she's been determined, quote, to create a movement willing to live the politics of sexual danger in order to create a culture of human hope. These, she tells us in the title of her book, are her most dangerous desires, and we all, every one of us here, owes you our gratitude for your refusal to be silent. Love you completely. So um, next, our next uh, testimonial this evening will be from Kenyon Farrow. Kenyon <laughs> is a writer, editor, strategist with expertise in a number of different areas, including public health, healthcare, social safety, net, and social justice. Kenyon has also worked on campaigns of grand and small size at national, local, as well as international levels. His focus of his work in those social movements around imprisonment, homelessness, LGBTQ rights, and is highly sought after in his work. Currently, he's the senior editor with thebody.com and thebodypro.com. Prior to joining thebody.com, he served as US and global health policy director with the Treatment Action Group. He is also known for his work with organizations such as, as Queers for Economic Justice, Critical Resistance, and Fierce. I introduce Kenyon Farrow. Good evening, everybody. Ah, oh. <laughs> Amber. Um, so right before I met Amber Hollibau, um, it was around, and the circumstances that sort of brought our, our lives together and, and now a friendship for almost 15 years, um, I wasn't, at the time, particularly connected to queer organizing, per se. Um, I'd lived in New York for several years, but I had taken a break and, and taken a job, actually, in New Orleans, working for Critical Resistance and was um, helping to organize uh, chapters of that organization um, in four southern cities. And um, I was in Atlanta, this is uh, early 2004, um, working uh, when I passed a newsstand with the Atlanta Journal-Constitution on a Sunday that had a cover story about same-sex marriage coming to Georgia, right? <laughs> um, and on the cover of the magazine, or the cover of the, the Sunday Atlanta Journal-Constitution was this very, you know, well-fed, well-scrubbed, you know, gay couple uh, fighting for marriage equality. 
And, um, and then the opposition on the other very next photo was um, a black heterosexual and named sort of Christian couple as the voiced opposition to gay marriage. Um, and, you know, I read it and that sort of like pissed me off and I like got to thinking and, um, you know, ended up writing a piece um, called Is Gay Marriage Anti-Black, which, um, you know, some of my friends have referred to now as my Purple Rain. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, or thriller or whatever, you know, fill in the blank, whatever you're like a virgin, whatever your culture reference is. Um, but as it got traction, um, it was sort of one of the things that got Amber and I in the room about a year later, uh, which in, uh, you know, 2005, I was invited to participate in a retreat of sorts, which was a group of scholar activists, some of whom are in this very room. Uh, to discuss our collective analysis of both uh, sort of gay marriage or same-sex marriage and the equality movement that was organized and funded uh, to, to move the issue. And it was in that room and in the subsequent weeks that we crafted the Beyond Marriage Statement, um, which is a document that would sort of gain traction among the left, for among people who are really looking for ways to think about the issue beyond, you know, either sort of pro, you know, marriage equality or, or not, and therefore not, and, you know, kind of, you know, raging homophobes. Um, but to think sort of beyond that, as the, as the document sort of stated. Um, and it was in that room that I fell in love with Amber, with her, her, her mind, her intellect, her continuing to push both the politics of, of desire and, of, and poverty and economic justice as we thought about what it would mean to create a, a movement where people's families, however they were constructed, would be uh, both kind of identified and recognized and allowed to thrive um, without uh, the foot of the state. Um, <laughs> so shortly thereafter, it kind of felt like Amber was like, I got you. <laughs> so all of a sudden, you know, I found myself um, working with QEJ um, kind of first as a, a facilitator on the Economic Justice Institute at Creating Change, which we did for many years. And an institute to this day, I'm still kind of pulled aside by many people who say, you know, who come from the sort of LGBT movement, that that institute really helped shape how they, you know, began to do work. And even some of the people I know who came through that, those workshops who I speak to, who are now part of Black Lives Matter, part of a whole number of sort of movement spaces, through which um, something about that sort of helped them also think about how their queerness was related to a range of other work that they would later go on and do. Um, but I remember sitting at one of the, like the uh, institute at one point, and Amber sitting next to me, turned to me and said, sweetie, I have a question for you. And I said, sure. And she said, um, do you identify as a femme? And I said, Yes, I do. <laughs> like, <laughs> and that was the first time anybody had ever asked me that question. And, um, and, and it, it actually, for, for me, really opened up a whole nother kind of set of possibilities because, you know, I was like, you know, a queen. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and, and um, you know, didn't sort of, you know, we're trying to sort of sort through like how people sort of responded to me like in a kind of, in a sort of gendered way. Um, you know, we were thick as thieves like from that moment on. And so from there, um, you know, I, you know, joined the board of, of Queer for Economic Justice where we worked together for several years and then I joined the staff and then later became um, ED. And uh, Amber was always my partner in crime and my comrade. Um, I think that what I saw in Amber was, you know, somebody who helped me clarify what was missing in my attempts to find a political home in New York City, which was focused, you know, kind of on, you know, issues of economic justice and also on issues of, of desire and sexual liberation. So part of that story for me was I grew up in, a, uh, in Cleveland, Ohio, um, in a poor working class uh, family in the housing projects. But contrary to sort of popular beliefs, um, there were plenty of queer people around, and there was no secret about it. Um, my family, uh, both mother, father, aunts, uncles, grandmamas, were friends with, you know, LGBT folks who were in the neighborhood, folks 
partied at our house, you know, whatever, and it was never um, hidden or any, any secret. Um, and when I moved to New York City in, in 99, um, and was starting to sort of get my wits about me, both as a queer person interested in social justice work, I found that many people and organizations actually didn't really want to deal with the impact of poverty on the lives of queer people, much less in the ways that they, much less in the ways the kind of city's changing economy at the time, which was kind of the growth of financial services and the kind of people who labor, you know, in that industry, along with Giuliani, you know, Rudy Giuliani's kowtowing to that, you know, uh, to, you know, um, impact just the very kind of places that people could live, party, turn tricks, make art, um, and all of that was becoming just increasingly impossible at the same time that the New York City Police Department, just actual numbers was exploding and increasing use of quality of life offenses to target homeless and poor people in public space, which only became worse after 9-11-2001 and under the uh, Bloomberg administration. And this is where the crisis was happening. While at the same time, our sort of movement was, you know, moving towards marriage, right? When everybody couldn't figure out like how the fuck they were gonna like live or get from point A to point B, um, you know, without being harassed by the cops. So, you know, I remember at that time going on job interview after job interview, with LGBT organizations, some HIV organizations, um, and this was after returning from my time uh, organizing around criminalization and the prison industrial complex in New Orleans, and I was asked by organization after organization, what does this work have to do with LGBT people? Or, not all LGBT youth are peer trash, as I was told in one interview. Um, and so, QEJ for me became a place where none of those things were disparate, none of those things were uh, uh, novel, <laughs> or that my own sort of experience, um, you know, as a you know young black gay man at the time, you know, growing up in a kind of working class and poor neighborhood, um, you know, was was somehow uh, a, a sort of a foreign idea or something that I kind of had to set aside. Um, and so for me, it's kind of for Amber, one of the founders of, of QEJ, you know, I think, um, you know, just is really important in terms of like the grounding of that work. And so I just want to speak for a second to some of the actual things that QEJ did in the span of time that it was around um, that I think were, were really critical. So one, I mentioned the Beyond Marriage Statement and how that sort of moved throughout the world. Or um, two, um, getting New York City before there was same-sex marriage laws passed to pass a, um, uh, to change this domestic partnership sort of statute so that queer people and or any people who call themselves family could get access to the city shelter system as family and not as single adults who were often split up if you were in the shelter system and discovered to be in a relationship. Right? Um, for trans folks and gender non conforming folks in the shelter system to be able to choose which gendered side of the shelter system they wanted to, to go in. Um, developing a community participatory research project called A Fabulous Attitude, um, which still gets cited in academic publications to this day. Um, uh, developing a um, uh, sort of uh, project with uh, Barnard Center for Women, which became, you know, the, a new queer agenda as a um, publication, which some of the folks who uh, were co-editors with me, Lisa Dugan, and other folks here in the audience, helped to also um, usher in. Um, and so these were just some of the things that like QEJ was really influential in doing. And so as a small organization that kind of was able to move local sort of policy work, but also had the vision and was pushing the national agenda um, in a different way, it was no small feat at the time. And so much of the spirit of QEJ was due to, to Amber's uh, passion and vision for, for those things. So where are we now? Um, <laughs> Marriage has passed, right? Isn't everyone happy? Are we all? <laughs> all is good now. Um, <laughs> you know, the money has moved, but the issues have not. New York City is still too fucking expensive. And frankly, every other city in the United States is following just in its stead. So there's almost nowhere to go. We're losing queer spaces. We have uh, people trying to pass religious freedom laws to just get around having to, 
you know, provide basic services and accommodations, right, to, to folks, which I think is actually in a way QEJ would also, I think, would have talked about this, was partly about queer and trans folks, but I think ultimately is geared to try to undermine the Civil Rights Act, right? If you ask me, that's, that's where they're going. Um, we still have an inordinate amount of violence against trans folks, trans women of color in every city in the country. Uh, you know, the sort of pushback against, you know, both uh, immigration that we're seeing and immigrants, and even just the pushback of birthright citizenship under the 14th Amendment. We have an AIDS movement at this point, which I have certainly kind of uh, situated myself in the last several years, um, that I have still am trying to push to actually like make a movement that actually addresses and, and, and actually says without hesitation that single payer universal health care is part of what we need in order to end the epidemic, right? <laughs> right? Um, I think we are in a space where, where particularly like lesbians, dykes, queer women, of, uh, queer women in particular, I think are being given sort of short shrift in terms of how we construct what is going on for queer people in this, in this country. Um, we have an odd sort of, I think, uh, almost sort of like lifestyle feminism that I think is becoming detached from a kind of capitalist, like an anti-capitalist uh, perspective, right? I think, you know, there's some troubling things that are, that are happening right now. Um, but I do have hope. I have hope because um, despite where we are in this country, I think that um, the work still exists. We are still in this room. We are here honoring Amber Hollabow. The work exists in the people that she has been able to touch, the people she's been able to mentor, the people she's been able to reach. So whether you identify yourself as femme, as a, a sex radical, as pro-desire, um, starting a, an organization like the Lesbian AIDS uh, Project that helped really kind of shift how people thought about you know, categories of risk, um, you know, in this country. Um, certainly, I think the legacy still lives. People still sort of lament in different moments. Um, you know, sort of the, the, the space that QEJ took up and the loss of that is still felt. I still think the work that Amber has been doing the last five years around queer survival economies, I think is still important. Those started kind of in some of my last days at QEJ. We started to have conversations when we moved offices to Chelsea. We sat around and said, you know, Amber, I said, you know, we're, we're in Chelsea. And we started to have conversations about what that meant. We started to ask each other, well, what's, we do work in the shelter system with, with queer and trans folks on welfare, but what is happening to folks who are the strippers in these clubs, the barbacks in these clubs, the drag queens who perform in these clubs, what are the conditions under which they work? We assume that they're supposed to be happy because they're in a kind of gay space to work, but we don't know what the wage, the tips are being taken, et cetera, and how do we start to build a project that actually addresses that community? It is almost no surprise that we struggled and couldn't get the shit funded, right? Like after meeting, after meeting, a meeting with funders Amper and I would go to read our whole written up project perspectives, get a lot of, uh-huh, you know, yeah, it, sounds, it sounds good. And then some commitments that didn't come through, right? But I still see that that work um, is, is, is critical. Um, and even just getting the sort of framework that I think Amber's continued to do around queer survival economies out in the world to get people to think differently. So just in closing, I think that um, it was sort of said before, I think one of, for me again, the real importance of Amber's uh, work, not just to me personally, but I think that she's left us uh, and has, has uh, pushed as a movement that, you know, we come out in ways that we do because of desire, right? because of sex, the kind of sex that we want to have and who we want to have it with, right? And under what conditions, that that still matters, right? In the context of, of the work. Um, and as she really pushed, before it became kind of a popular sort of social justice nomenclature about the politics of respectability, like Amber was leveraging those politics, right, for 40 fucking years, right? <laughs> Pushing against those kinds of politics as they existed in queer spaces. So with that, I just want to say, Amber, sweetie, 
I'm a little bit less femme these days. I like turned 30 in my late 30s and I got like all dudish and shit. I'm like, what, what's, what's happening? I got gray, like the boys are like, hey daddy, I don't know what happened. <laughs> But <laughs> it's part of the conversation around aging. <laughs> Gender sometimes changes too. <laughs> um, but with that, in all seriousness, I want to say thank you. Thank you for the impact of your work on my life. Thank you for always making me feel like I was OK uh, as, as whoever I was showing up in the room, um, showing me that it was uh, uh, but there was a, a path beyond, as was said in the, in the video, sort of, you know, just becoming one sort of ED or nonprofit exec, one after the other, one job f from the next to whatever, but always being committed to a vision and a, a radical politics, no matter where you find yourself. Thank you, love. <laughs> And finally, our last testimonial will, is coming from Heather Maria Ock. Heather is an award-winning performer, writer, filmmaker, drag queen, and cultural worker. Her work explores queer radical subcultures, punk DIY aesthetics, and femme and then identities. Her company, Femme Power Productions, centers on marginalized artists in front of and behind the camera. She's working class raised, Appalachia, and mixed race Anglo Chicana, based in Brooklyn. Additionally, she is co founder of Heels on Wheels, a queer femme and in spectrum, all genders arts organization, and winner of the Lambda Literary Award for Glitter and Grit. Without further ado, Heather. Okay. Exterior, wide shot, radical bookstore, 1970s, San Francisco. The sign reads, modern times. Cut to, Interior Radical Bookstore. The shelves are packed with used copies of Marx and other leftist writings. A young femme dyke with blonde hair organizes the chaos, reaching to adjust these precious volumes with care and efficiency. Cut to interior. The hustle and bustle of a vegetarian restaurant. Dishes clatter as steaming trays of healthy greens and tofu pass by. A young dyke with short brown hair saunters towards the back through the chaos to start her shift. Cut to. The young femme exits the bookstore with a stack of radical writings. She navigates the San Francisco streets with her books, approaching the vegetarian restaurant. Interior restaurant. Close up on the books resting on a table, the young femme reads as she waits for her order. The young dyke with short hair approaches the table with a plate of food. Uh, I've got your mixed vegetable plate with brown rice. She turns to leave, then stops herself. I have to ask, who are you? Who the fuck are you? You've been coming in here for weeks with a stack of these books. I have to know who you are. This is the first meeting of Amber and Sherry Muraga, two of my biggest inspirations as a queer artist and activist. They met as strangers in person in San Francisco in the 1970s, before Facebook, Tumblr, Tinder, before the internet. If you saw someone with a stack of books that mirrored the ways you were thirsty to change the world, you had to pause, you had to act, you had to connect. Amber said to me, that's how you build relationship. You give me brown rice and I give you a book. Isn't that so beautiful? I said, if I get through this without crying, it's going to be a miracle. And both Amber and her partner and other femme friends that I talked to today, they said, just cry. It's fine. <laughs> so I, I love femmes. Um, this meeting was the beginning of a friendship. 
At the time, Sherry was working on this bridge called My Back with Gloria Anzaldúa, another of my queer inspirations. Amber said when she would visit Sherry's apartment, she would often find them writing and editing away at the kitchen table. Right, kitchen table press. Um, extra, extra credit for that. Uh, Sherry also wanted to write an article with Amber. Amber told her, you know I didn't go to school, I don't know how to write like that. So Sherry said, okay, we'll interview each other and write it down. This became what we're rolling around in bed with. I love, yeah. I love that they supported each other in this way. That all of these writers and many others were so dedicated to what I call making something out of nothing. They created something where before there was an absence, a loneliness, a suffering. So they gathered stories and published essays that pushed back against the white upper middle class feminism that refused to recognize or respect them, and in doing so, changed history, her story, quistery. For what we're rolling around in bed with, Amber and Sherry were frustrated at the lack of space and judgment that it existed around explicitly discussing sex and desire in the feminist movement at that time. Again, read white upper middle class feminism. They wanted an honest conversation about queer sexuality, kink, to unpack butch femme dynamics. Now, I have a lot of respect for Sherry, who is a mentor of mine, and the section of the article always makes me laugh. Uh, this is a long time ago. Sherry says to Amber in the interview, but what is femme to you? I told you once that what I thought of, that when, what I thought of femme was passive, unassertive, etc., and you didn't fit that image. And you said to me, well, change your definition of femme. <laughs> Thank you, Amber. I know for a fact that she did, and growth is a valuable uh, gift as we build community, right? Changing the definition of femme has been a life work for Amber, both intentionally and, in my opinion, simply by being herself. I first stepped, book, I first stepped foot into a radical bookstore in the late 90s New York City, most likely the anarchist blackout books or feminist blue stockings, eventually traveling to San Francisco to modern times, the collective that Amber had been a part of years before. By that time, this bridge called my back, Borderlands, La Frontera, and shortly after in 2000, Amber's book, My Dangerous Desires, A Queer Girl Dreaming Her Way Home, were on the shelves. Through the incredible tenacity, creativity, and perseverance of queer artists and activists that came before me, there was a dedication to telling stories, books to hold them, and radical bookstores to house those volumes that allowed me to walk into a safe haven and find these stories waiting for me, to see myself reflected. Raised by a single mother, growing up working class, mixed race Anglo-Chicana with an absent father, queer, femme, add in some Dorothy Allison to, re to reflect my Appalachian heritage, I saw that I could not only survive, but thrive. It wasn't going to be easy, but it could be done. And the best way was together. I remember first seeing the cover of My Dangerous Desires, the motorcycle, right? The protest, the beautiful femme face of Amber, the title drawing me right in. I couldn't believe there was someone who was so similar to me, who admitted the fears and anxieties caused by growing up poor or working class and being around educated activists and intellectuals, who talked openly about sex work, who was high femme and tough as nails. I loved the introduction by Dorothy Allison, how she noticed that Amber tucked away some extra sugar packets in her purse the first time they met, they met for coffee. I'm certain I never purchased a condiment for the first seven plus years I, of my life in New York City. <laughs> when I first moved here, I would go out for food with a group, saying, oh no, I'm not hungry, and then wait until everyone else was full noticing that many didn't take home leftovers and eat what was left on their plates. <sighs> Reviewing my dangerous desires for this event brought unexpected tears to my eyes as the visceral, gut-wrenching impact of reading these words almost 20 years prior came rushing back to me. Dorothy writes of her in Amber. 
Them girls dance on razor blades every day of their lives. And some days it is only bravado that keeps us upright. I am so thankful that these books ex exist, that these stories are documented. These and so many more, Otter Lord, Leslie Feinberg. When I first entered radical community, it was expected that we read these books, learned about our legacies and the legacies of others as allies. That was part of building community, building a movement. I quoted Amber's words in my graduate school thesis. I was the first of my friends to attend graduate school after a full scholarship for undergrad, which had allowed me to move to New York City. I chose a major university for my graduate studies on the gamble that it would help me get ahead in life, rise above the working class strata I had been raised in. I cried every day my first semester because I felt stupid, because I felt like I wasn't good enough, because I felt like I didn't belong. But I knew that wasn't true. Well, I still don't know if I really belonged. But I knew I was not stupid, and I knew that I was worthy because people like Amber had traveled unwelcoming, unfamiliar paths before and survived to write about it. And in that writing, admitted fear, showing vulnerability, and in doing so, showing me our strength. That, to me, is femme. Amber writes, my life as a queer woman, a too poor girl, a mixed race hooker, a left wing activist, was never meant to be remembered or told, never meant to endure or count. At best, the lives of the people I came from was the stuff of derision, the fodder for mean-spirited humor. This is the juncture between myself and history with a big H, and I know it. I was determined to create original theater and performance that reflected the lives of people I love, the ones on the margins, the ones left off the page, the screen, that history with a small H, and I did before, during, and after that institution. I was determined that Amber's words would be marked as part of my journey there, that they would know I was not alone. I had history, her story, quistery, that I was part of a legacy, and to get ready, because more of us were on the way. The first time I met Amber was years later, in person at an activist event. She was sitting in a chair. I kneeled down on the floor in front of her. I was meeting royalty. She clasped my hands and was so tender and so supportive as I told her what she meant to me, what she meant to so many of my femme friends. Amber agreed to perform at a queer femme event I ran with Heels on Wheels. Heels on Wheels was a queer femme, all genders performance group I co-founded in 2010. So Kenyon, you would have been very welcome. <laughs> we produced an annual DIY tour and monthly salon for new work by queer artists for seven plus years, dedicated to intersectional representation for queer uh, artists of all genders with a particular focus on femmes. We told Amber we were planning to make a book, a queer performance anthology. She encouraged us and told us how hard it had been to get anything queer published how even when her book was published, there were still so many challenges. Amber told me a story about her first academic conference. She had asked someone what to wear and borrowed a blazer. <laughs> Seems like the right drag, right? <laughs> I thought about wearing a blazer tonight, and I was like. She took the Greyhound bus, but couldn't let anyone know that's how she got there. I took the Greyhound bus home every holiday from New York City to West Virginia for 20 hours or more to visit my family when I was in college and my mother was still alive. I said to Amber on the phone, thank you, Amber, for getting on that bus. If you hadn't, I and so many others would not be here. She laughed, like I imagine a real big sister that loves you would, would and said, oh, honey, that's not true. <laughs> you would have figured out a way just like we did. Cut two. I am standing on stage 
in a, in a thrifted floor-length sequin gown. There's a whole group of us, femmes in thrifted sparkling gowns. We're at the Lambda Literary Awards, screaming with excitement. Our collection on queer performance, Glitter and Grit, has just won the award for best anthology. I don't think they were quite re ready for that much femme. The anthology includes over 60 queer artists representing a diversity of intersectional identities and artistic mediums. The hours of work, late nights at our kitchen tables, and certainly some tears. It was all worth it. We will not be erased. Amber was right. We did figure it out. We are still figuring it out, learning and growing every day. Amber also made films, as many of you know, directing an award-winning documentary about educating women on HIV and AIDS that played at the Sundance Film Festival and received national release on PBS. I've started making films as well through my company, Femme Power Productions. We are currently creating a narrative anthology series about intersectional queer radical communities. Their first film was about a group of queer punk sex workers and premiered at the biggest LGBT queer film festival in the country. Our next film just started pre-production and takes place over the course of an evening at a queer dance party and a drag show. I am so thankful for the work of activists and artists that came before me, that I am in legacy, that I am a part of a lineage. Amber writes in the introduction of my dangerous desires, I have wanted to find you, to tell you that I am here, to invite you to remember me or add your own unique experience to our common purpose, our collective tale, to come home with me, to join me in changing the world. Thank you, Amber, for looking for me, for being a beacon, for creating a home with me, home, for creating a home for me with your work when my other homes have been tenuous. Thank you for your vision, your honesty, vulnerability, and strength. I remember you every day with every project I create, femme adornment I wear proudly, every moment I choose to love myself and fight for others. Thank you, Amber. I dedicate my life to accepting your generous invitation. Thank you. So, um, for, well, thank you all again for all of your words that you shared with us. And so, without further ado, um, I introduce our recipient of Kessler 2018, Amber Hollywood. Don't you think we just had a break for drinks? <laughs> um, I want to thank Clags for this um, honor. Um, especially 
Debanush, who has been a friend and a and a and a a person of importance in my life. Um, and CLAGS as an organization has been an important part of my life, um, not simply by being on the board, but in its very beginning to insist on the, re the, the brilliance and the importance of recognizing, recognizing queer thinking. Why queer thinking, queer intellectual work, queer um, engagement with political issues had value when there was nothing at that point that recognized being a queer thinker. So it means a great deal to me to have Clags recognize me in this way. Um, it's something that um, I've come to many of these um, lectures because I wanted to hear the people that were speaking. I wanted to hear their thinking, their work, their ideas about what mattered. And I want to thank all the people that presented tonight. Um, all of you are people that I, I love in, in very deep ways. And uh, I won't forget ever what you said. And I want to, um, to dedicate this talk to, queer, to two queer organizations that I love but that are no longer here, although they're still profoundly needed. I dedicate this talk to both of those organizations because when I do my movement work, I see the faces of the people who were a part of those groups, few of, you of whom would come here or ever feel that they could come here. They might wear the wrong clothes, have bad teeth, use words incorrectly. Both the Lesbian AIDS Project and Queers for Economic Justice are gr the groups that I want to dedicate this to. Um, because it is in those places that I saw my own history um, and my own um, and the value of doing work and demanding work in places that often had been invisible. And as I come here tonight, I think about issues of, of hope and the power of desire, which is what I call this talk, because I think it's important to consider how we imagine changing the world. What do we think that would look like? How do we dream it? What are its pieces, its skeleton? What would we do first? Where in our social change movements do we have those conversations? Or do we have them at all? And frankly, where is sex and desire in those conversations and in the dreams that we have for an explosive, erotic life? How can it be that we are building political movements and yet the significance of hope, of vision, and desire remains in such short supply? I don't know why these three remain so invisible, but their absences diminish our ability to believe in the possibility of radical social change. Radical social change that would happen in our lives and in our futures. Because it's important to remember that before we can build something, we have to imagine it. I'm here tonight to talk about absences and what they mean for us politically. The reality is that all of those abs the absences that I think of as so critical are absences that are invisible 
in the way that we understand political change and political um, activism. Because the people that are a part of those questions and issues are people that our movements have often made decisions to leave out, whether intentionally or by the way that they construct themselves, which would make people that come from poverty, that come from kink, that come from leather, that come from places that they would not otherwise want to have to explain in a room of people that don't look like them, well, where those people gather. And I say it with kind of a lifetime of frustration and exhaustion that not understanding that questions of vision, of hope, of desire are political not personal, are a part of how you begin to understand it, not simply about who you go to bed with or who you want to go to bed with. It's about something that has to do with imagining all that you can be in a moment of time where desire and the possibility of change appear possible. As I've said in my own book, I've lived on the wrong side of sex since birth. This is both who I am and who I was meant to be, though it isn't all that there is. But I know that the power of radical hope is based on a vision for a world that's completely transformed, a world where hope and pleasure and desire refuses to put people before profit and a world that doesn't think pleasure is an afterthought to the really important things that a Marxist agenda regards as critical to the consequence of possibility and revolution. No, not really. We are living in a terrifying time, truly a terrifying time, driven by Trump and the Republican Party and the sociopathic um, movements of the hard right and the self-proclaimed um, fascists and paramilitary. All of those which existed in the United States before Trump, but all of which have been emboldened by his presidency. I stand here tonight in resistance to all of those groups and their members as a person who's been battling these movements since I was 17. I'm now 72. I've been walking this path for 55 years. <laughs> Being a Kessler lecturer honors me because it allows me to bring to the stage, all the invisible people who would rarely feel invited here. Too queer, too poor, too strange, too POC or mixed race, too marked by a history of incarceration or addiction. Too outside because of racism or anti-Semitism. Too female, however you define that, too transgender, too genderqueer, too HIV positive, too much of an immigrant, too disabled, too struggling with access and inclusion, too much of a hooker or a whore, too working class or just too goddamn high femme to be able to hold the space. So to now, tonight that brings all of those things with me. And it's why I come here to accept this and do this talk. But where I started, where I came from, was very different. That was a world of hopelessness, a world where desperation defined the structure 
and the limits of what you could imagine and how you would understand your own growing up and where you might be able to go. It was the kind of hopelessness that surrounded me and I think surrounds people with my kinds of background and history in a way that you have no idea how to get out of. You have no idea what else might be possible. It isn't as though you have any literal sense of what it would mean to get out of a trailer park and go someplace that would give you the possibility of a different kind of life. I mean, you could go to another trailer park. That kind of frames it. But you couldn't, but there, it, you couldn't imagine what else would, might be possible because it's only something that you've seen in a film or on television. It's, it's bound by a certain kind of wealth and a certain kind of privilege that nobody you know has ever had and is unlike, and, and if they have, they, they've left and they never return. They never come back. So you have no sense of what it might mean to get out. I mean, people talked occasionally about maybe what it would mean to go to nursing school or what it might mean to be a teacher. But I am the first person in my family to have graduated from high school. People like myself never left the places that I came from. As well, people that come from my kind of background rarely or often don't survive the thing that is true about their own forbidden desires and erotic imaginations. I believed myself to be both perverted and impaired. I had no idea who else might be queer and, who the, and how it might be to live a queer life, though I had had pointed out to me quite often in my trailer park the dykes that lived over there that nobody would talk to, the faggots that fixed people's hair unless they'd been beaten to a pulp on Saturday night by my brothers and cousins. But you didn't bring up desire. Desire wasn't what you would ever assume would propel your life. You were a straight girl. You got married. The only question was whether you were going to be pregnant before you got married or afterwards. Nothing else. I knew in the context of that hopelessness that I was never meant to escape the despair of my upbringing. I understood that it was a hopelessness of class and race and gender and that my own family had been so marginalized um, and had been considered so odd. Motorcycle riding, Romany, Gypsy, Irish, poor white trash, never the kind of people that you wanted to say that you came from. But within even that construction, I couldn't find queerness. The idea of having options, which is what I often hear people say, when you come from a mixed race family where you watch your father being thrown off one construction site after another because he's the brown person in the white crew, when he comes home and he and my grandmother talk about having been branded by the Ku Klux Klan in a 
port town in Oregon when they traveled in the caravans that Romani people traveled in, and my grandmother was a sex worker. They would tell me about what people who called them gypsies thought, that they'd always steal your silverware, or maybe they'd rape your daughter. That was the world they taught me to try and figure out how to survive in. But I was not a person that was prepared to give up dreaming. In fact, that's pretty much all I did. My mother would say to me that the only thing that I could do well was read a book. And she would say to me, reading books won't get you a job. You need to know how to work hard and not complain. You need to stop being a dreamer. She was bitter at the things that had confronted her and shaped her life. A woman who had her first child at 14 and a half and had that child die before she was 16. It was a brutality that she had ra been raised with that she never forgot and she never forgave. And she did not want me to have hopes that could never be realized. She had no idea how you might do hope. It's like hope was, it was frivolous. Hope was foolish and little. And you could only be heartbroken if you had hope. So their job was to teach me to be tough enough to know how to survive to finish high school and not get pregnant, to stop dating the bikers I was running with by the time I was 12, to not be so rebellious, to suck it up, that the raw shape of the things around me were all that I would have, and I had to figure out how to live with those. I wasn't prepared to do what they said to me needed to be done. Having worked a whole range of the worst kind of jobs that you work in a life like that, from the kind of waitressing you do to working in a factory that made ice cream cones, uh, working in the back of a dry cleaning plant, um, picking tobacco, I saw what my parents meant, and it isn't like I had an idea of how to get out. So I became a nightclub dancer in Vegas, a stripper in San Francisco, and a hooker in most of the towns that I worked in. And the pay was a lot better. It still didn't answer the question of how I could have a different future but it gave me the possibility of economically surviving and not being ground down so badly that I would give up hope. But it was finding activism and a world of radical ideas that first began to actually change the way that I had been taught hopelessness. It was the civil rights movement, the women's liberation movement, the fullness of what those both brought to the idea of making a different world. And it began to teach me about class, about where I'd come from, and that it wasn't because my parents were failures or I was that I had come from the background that I found my, in my own history. My mother, hoping actually to change the possibility of my life, found a list of boarding schools um, in the back of a Vogue magazine at a doctor's office. 
she tore out the listing and wrote to every single one of those schools asking if they had scholarships. She did not want me to have the life that she knew I was facing. One of those schools wrote back and said they had just begun to create a scholarship for uh, low achiever, high IQ students. <laughs> and they needed somebody from California. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And so I flew from uh, Bakersfield um, to Lugano, Switzerland. And I learned about class. <laughs> I had a magenta suit, dress suit, um, and magenta heels, quite high fuck me pumps. And I tinted my bleach blonde hair with a slight tint of pink so it would go with my suit. And I flew off to Lugano, Switzerland and um, began to learn about what the real, the real living experience is of being the wrong person in the wrong place. My mother had made all my clothes and she had made them reversible so that I would have more things to wear. Um, where the kids that went to that school were kind of, they'd go to Paris and bring back a trunk load of things. And the fact that the book that was the book from the school that told you what you could bring said you could only have this amount of this and this amount of that, they paid no attention to it. Um, and I, um, I both longed for what I began to find there that I had never even knew existed. Remarkable things, M reading Middle English, M reading Chaucer in Middle English, uh, you know, really, who knew? Um, <laughs> and, um, but I was failing because I had no idea how, what were the expectations of how you studied. I, I couldn't imagine it. Um, and uh, I went to the one person that was a teacher there that I thought might understand or be sympathetic, who was an, a first immigrant um, Lebanese man um, who said to me, you were never meant to be here. You are not failing because you're stupid. You were never meant to be here. And he gave me the Communist Manifesto. <laughs> and it changed my world. I really didn't know what to think. I, I was quite amazed, but it was clear to me then my parents weren't totally responsible for the fact that we were poor. Um, <laughs> and I went back to his family's hot dog stand in New London, Connecticut, um, and joined the first uh, Communist Party study group um, where I began to learn the left. It was transforming. I was with other working class people. We would sit there and talk about the, the world of ideas. No one assumed that anybody had a high school diploma, let alone a college one. And no one assumed we were stupid. And at that time was the beginning of the Freedom Summer, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Activism was exploding in this country. And I joined that. 
and it saved my life. Because it get, no one assumed there that you had to go to college, although frankly, most of the people I knew in that movement had all dropped out of college um, rather than never had thought they could go. Um, but it was still true that there was a deep gulf between my radical work, the work that I did as a, a revolutionary, as a social change badass, <laughs> and my sexual life, both because I supported myself after those long, endless meetings, doing sex work or stripping, um, and dating stone butch women. And it was in those kinds of, in those kind of conflicts where I learned what it is that you can't do to not tell the truth about your life because you can't keep all of it hidden. It isn't possible to hide from people always what you do or who you want. And you don't want to. I mean, it wasn't like I was ashamed of who I was dating. It wasn't like I didn't want the women that I wanted. But lesbian separatism was um, not welcoming to those of us that they said had, were basically parroting um, heterosexuality. Um, and it was a movement that had just begun, the lesbian and gay movement, which is what it was called then. I believed in it. I loved it. It had given me life. It gave me hope. It, I, it was everything. I couldn't imagine that I would be in conflict with my own movement. I, I just couldn't bear it. It just seemed impossible. And yet I would, I would try and figure out what I could do about who I was and who I was attracted to. Because it was clear to me that what I wanted to do and who I wanted to do it with would never be acceptable to the political movement that I felt so strongly about. It was living through that crisis. It was actually trying to commit suicide at that moment um, because I couldn't, I couldn't bring the two together. I couldn't give up my movement and I couldn't give up my sexuality. The, I, I couldn't make them be in parallel worlds that I could live in. And that's when I, when I survived that, I began to understand what it meant when you don't talk about the things that you live through and that you understand and that make for a complicated world that you do the justice work within. The feminist sex wars happened. Um, those were brutal and bitter. Um, and it was after that that I decided to leave the feminist movement, as it was beginning to be called, um, and begin to do AIDS work, something that no one wanted to do when I began to do it. I was riding to, on the subway to my first job interview for the AIDS Discrimination Unit at the Human Rights Commission, um, reading a report that they had just issued about AIDS discrimination. And the person sitting next to me on the subway train saw what the cover of the report was and stood up and began to scream, she has AIDS, she has AIDS. And the next stop, the train doors opened and every single person left that subway cart. But it was an epidemic which brought home to me again that all the gifts that I had about sexuality, 
about class, about race, about desire, about difference, were precisely what was needed to fight in that epidemic. And what that crisis, that epidemic, gave to me in my relationships with lesbians with HIV, women who were told over and over again that they couldn't be, really be lesbians if they had AIDS, because real lesbians didn't have AIDS, and they had to have been sleeping with men or be sex workers or somehow too poor to be real lesbians, meaning lesbians that went to the LGBT community center. Um, when I began to do that work, it began to root me in the communities that I most cared about. And I could bring my skills to, my organizing ability, my thinking, my capacity to understand and to take things on. When we first started the uh, first group for lesbians with HIV at Rikers Island, um, they told me that no lesbian, nobody would come. I, I mean, it was the women's side of Rikers, and they said lesbians, uh, uh, people won't come to a lesbian AIDS group. So we started with three people, and in two weeks um, had 60 women. The first time I walked in to lead the group, I sat down and, you know, I was nervous and a butch said to me, isn't your name Amber? <laughs> I said, yeah. And she said, so isn't um, Stone Butch Blues dedicated to you? And I said, yeah. And she said, oh yeah, we're reading it. We like it. It tells our story. I learned in, in that struggle and brought what I learned to many other struggles that you have to actually spend, you have to commit yourself to learning the things you need to know. You can't assume that someone is going to, um, that you, how can I say this? Like, it, it was so extraordinary to me in the beginning of activism that we had study groups. Nobody assumed that you would learn Marxism because you would go to a, a class. You would study it with each other. You would investigate it. You would think through intellectual ideas. You would engage with them. Because of that history, I've been able to do both intellectual work and always do the organizing. Because an economic analysis, no matter how radical, can never ever reduce the parts of your life that bring you joy and pleasure with another human being. And a political movement that refuses to talk about pleasure that refuses to acknowledge joy, that says that lust is individual and private, is a movement that no one will ever want to join. <laughs> Thank you. Great, thank you so much. Um, now we will be um, having our Q&A portion. 
Um, so I will be able to uh, pass these mics around. Uh, they told me this was going to be a, que <laughs> a question and answer period, so what the hell? If people have questions or want to bring things up or comments, all of those would be welcome. You know, I, I'll always talk. <laughs> um, so I don't really have a question, but... Um, as somebody who hasn't been that involved in, in CLAGS over the last many years, um, I want to say, like, I'm excited to be here, and I was so excited to see you getting this award and giving this lecture. Um, for context, Amber and I worked together for, like, two years at the task force a while back. Um, and having been thoroughly uh, neoliberal in my previous fundraising jobs, um, she really gave me... I just posted this on Facebook and tagged you on it, but you're like one of my intellectual heroes because um, you let me, me, you, and Jessica Stern at the task force were like the three femmes that were running around torturing all the boys. Um, <laughs> and I just, I'm just so touched and I'm just, you know, I just think it's amazing and I'm, you know, so happy for you and so proud to know you. Thank you, Christian. We have one in the back. I just so first would like to say it's very inspirational to hear everybody up there. Um, I'm a transgender, gender queer. Um, my thought um, comes from a PFLAG meeting um, uh, that has a transgender workshop. And it comes from my own experience for the past 10 years being an activist um, about how we identify in being, as being gender non-conforming. I'm non-binary, but um, it seems as though at the transgender meetings at PFLAG and with my own private therapy and the, and, and the population I'm I face, um, there's a thought about being gender confirming that, that, that and not necessarily non-conforming, that, um, that if we can include the whole umbrella of transgender as transgender, and can, that it, it's possible in today's political climate to consider ourselves confirming of our gender rather than non-conforming of another expectation. I just was wondering if there's any thought about that. Yes. <laughs> yes, that's exactly right. And I think it's both things. I think it's both... Um, an engagement and willingness to challenge gender and to confirm and respect it and, and be generous to each other in our understanding of both how we live and how we change through time. And I, so I think that what you're saying is important as a reminder of, of that. Congratulations, Amber. You deserve this award. My question has to do with reflecting on FEM, and, uh, and I'm going to ask it of both the FEMs, or all, any of the one who identifies with FEM on this stage, but the, the binary rules, the heterosexual rules of what FEM means, and how you negotiated and weaved your way through to find out what a strong femme, what a soft femme, 
what a non-binary femme actually means. You know, I, uh, well, for, for example, I, for most of my political life, I had very short hair. I just didn't want to take the heat, frankly, because I was never prepared to give up makeup. So <laughs> I felt like if I kept my hair about that long, but I had extraordinary uh, makeup on, then fuck them, you know? Um, and, because it was radical also to have really short hair as a woman. So I also believed in it. It wasn't just a kind of an act of resistance. Um, and I, I've only actually begun to grow my hair because I started to dream of myself aging with long white hair. And I thought, you know what? I, I actually think that that matters. I want to pay attention to that. And I was in my 50s. And I thought, you know, I'm old enough, really. Nobody's really going to bring it up to my face anymore, which they used to. I mean, really, people were quite comfortable in telling me that they thought that I was on the slippery side of heterosexuality um, <laughs> until I would begin talking. And then they would not be so thoughtless to ever say that again. Um, but I don't want to just say it in terms of, of defiance. It, it broke my heart. It really did break my heart. And I was, you know, I had felt that my desire for butch women was the first time for me that I had ever been able to possess my own body. That I'd ever had desire which I chose and which fulfilled me in the way that I imagined. And to have that denigrated, to have the women that I desired made fun of or told that they were men, and to have my own desire made light of was brutal. And it was very hard to, um, to push back on, except in defiance, but, but really was hard to take on because I wasn't sure myself what it meant. No one talked about anything in, in the context of an erotic life. Nobody talked about an, a sexual imagination. Certainly no political people that I knew, except actually gay men, um, were a place that I could have that kind of conversation. And so uh, the idea that I'd have to give up the women that I was attracted to in order to be a part of the political movement that I felt had saved my life was just an unacceptable set of choices. It just, it couldn't be done. And that is when I tried to kill myself. And it was coming out of that when I swore that I'd never stop talking about it. I really, I'd never stop talking about it because I'd be damned if one more person was going to go someplace after a, a queer pride march and try to kill themselves because they didn't fit in to the movement that they supposedly were watching walk by them. It was like, you're just never doing that to any of us again. Yeah? Well, that's a perfect segue, Amber, because I was going to start off by saying, um, that it's so interesting, right, that these, um, you know, these very like open-minded communities, so whether that's the radical left or whether that's um, anarchism or punk um, uh, or queer community, you know, those are the worlds that I'm coming out of, how, you know, they love to advocate for um, inclusivity and being counterculture and, um, you know, do whatever you want, man, and uh, like autonomy, and, uh, and yet in all of those different communities that I um, have been a part of over the years, why yet at the same time is everyone in my business about what I wear, how I look, and who I fuck? 
Like, I just, I, I really couldn't. And so I have always been so thankful, Amber, for people like you and other people who are openly femme to say, you know, okay, I have people to look to. I have people who were there before me who, you know, are strong and amazing in all these ways that we've celebrated tonight. Um, and that when I felt disappointed at the ways that what I would say now are white supremacy and patriarchy playing out within these um, uh, communities that were feeding femphobia and misogyny that I had people to look to. And I feel really lucky to be um, part, uh, that part of my journey has been to um, not only embrace femme and create, um, you know, femme community um, in many cities around uh, the country, but to really expand what femme looks like, acts like, sounds like, and to make, to be really aware of and making space for and um, deferring to femmes of color and non-binary femmes and trans-feminine femmes and to uh, learn from and dedicate time to um, that expansion. As, I guess as I said in my remarks, <laughs> is sort of a form of them to a certain extent. Um, I think, you know, so for me, I um, just, when after I remember the first time you asked me that and I started to think about it, um, you know, kind of over time. And, you know, as a kid, I never, like I always felt male, but never like a man necessarily. And I was always kind of like, around certain boys or kind of, you know, men, I just didn't, or even like in debates in my family where, you know, kind of my mom and my aunts and stuff were debating men about different sort of politics that were about gender and feminism, I always were like, they're right. <laughs> like I said, I just sort of like, so it, it made sense to me in that perspective. Um, however, um, as I kind of alluded to from like, something shifted in my like late thirties. I just, I remember literally like looking in the mirror, I was like, you like, where did this man show up? Like all of a sudden, and even how people in terms of my like yeah. dating and sexual life showed up started to shift who kind of was attracted to me in a different way. So those things happen. I think now one of the things I, I find um, sort of troubling, I think to be frank about some of the sort of like ways sort of femme is being deployed within kind of queer spaces, particularly among men or, you know, cisgender men or whatever, I have problems with that term, but whatever, but like, but there's a way that it becomes about like sort of a performance, but, yeah. but, and actually sometimes there's a way to actually say if you're a femme, then you don't have to actually be accountable to like kind of patriarchy and misogyny and the way those things show right. up. Right. And so I, and so I'm now really happy in a, in a way to kind of both I, like really feel in a, like a man in my own kind of like way I identify now, but, but not for the protection of patriarchy per se, but because because I feel like it, I can say to folks like you, you know, there's still, you still have to be accountable to some shit, yeah. right? That you don't get to skirt because you like claim a certain identity per se, right? So I feel like I see some of that happening that is tr kind of troubling in the way it like becomes, it's like becoming deployed. Yeah. Is this on? Oh, thanks. Hi, Amber. <laughs> Mazel tov. Um, I was particularly moved by one point that you made about how difficult it was to get out of the poor community when you had no sense of what else is there because the few people who did succeed in breaking out of that community didn't come back. And it sort of resonated with me because I grew up in the suburbs of New Jersey and was all very heteronormative. But I had two gay cousins, much older than me, who lived in Manhattan. They had left Jersey because one of them got thrown out by my grandfather. And when I, I, I saw them at parties occasionally, but you know, you only dimly understood what their life was about. When I did finally come out, I got in touch with both of them. And we had these hysterical conversations like, oh, listen, girl, your grandfather is a terrible homophobe. And I had to deal with him 40 years ago. But what they both said to me was how sorry they were that they couldn't help me 
when I was younger because the whole understanding between them and their family was if and when you are tolerated to come back, you will not ever, ever refer to anything about your life in the city. And one of them said to me, you know, if I had said to you, hey, why don't you come into town and, uh, you know, meet my friends, they would have accused me of recruiting and that would have been the end of the family connection. Um, but, you know, you do somehow come out anyway, but it just seems like, why are there so many obstacles in the way of all of this? Because the hardest thing is imagining that there is an alternative, you know? The only idea I have of an alternative was, well, I have these faintly fey cousins who moved away and went to Manhattan, but it was very dim as to just what they were really about. And it could have been perfectly clear if they could have just said, so listen, dear, you know, we're gay, and you're obviously a little queen, and let's talk. <laughs> but no such thing, you know. And I guess the ultimate lesson of one of the things I admire about your work is just that insistence on being clear about what is, right? We'll take just two additional questions, just so you know, and thank you. Hello, hello. Um, thank you all so much. It's really beautiful to see queer people love each other. Um, I, <laughs> um, my question is about, um, I think hearing you talk about how beautiful it is and important it is to hold desire and pleasure and eroticism really resonates with me and feels really important. And then I also am thinking about spaces that I'm in and in queer spaces that I'm in where there's this maybe you could call it like neoliberal way of thinking and talking about sex and pleasure and desire that feels like um, uh, horrible. Um, <laughs> that it, That's very like, if I have kinky sex, I'm inherently a radical person, like watch me wear my chest harness while I cross this picket line. And I'm just wondering like, um, <laughs> uh, I, I don't know, like your thoughts please. Like how, how do we think about, um, how we hold like the importance of eroticism without falling into a, a sort of exactly the pattern that I just described. And thank you all, you're all great. Um, you know, I, I actually think it's a really complicated question. I don't think it's a simple question because it's not, it, you know, you don't want to be the person that's like, <laughs> constantly, you know, bringing up the clitoris at a Marxist, you know. I mean, you may, maybe you do, depends on who's running the meeting. Um, but you know what I mean, it makes it very, it is complicated and I think part of the challenge of knowing that it matters is trying to think about what that inclusion might look like. How would the textures of how you build a worldview be imagined if you were allowed to think about desire as one of the components of how you do that work? And how would it matter in the way that you do the work? You know, at QEJ, it, it was really clear that you know, the people that QEJ was working with were thrilled to have walls around them for privacy in order to have sex instead of having to have it on the street. That was the gift, was to be able to even be in a place where you didn't have to explain it to a guard and you didn't have to ask permission as an adult. You know, it, it, so it, it matters. 
And it mattered in terms of our ability to do that work because we knew that that was part of the conversation that had to happen and that it was part of the conversation we had to bring into the context of class. And so I, I, I think of what it might look like to have us all participate in study groups that took that on as a question. If we were to imagine the world transformed, how would we build it and what would it mean and how would we have sex and pleasure be a part of it? What would that, what would that look like? No one had ever asked me what that would look like. And the political movements I've been a part of have rarely asked that. And so that's the kind of thing that I think would really tr change both how we built political movements and who would want to join them because people would begin to believe that they had the right to be sexual and not just rebellious. Yeah, I, you know, in the context in which I grew up in this working class family in the Bronx, you know, 60 years, 65 years ago, it, I never had a conversation about sex with anyone. And this had nothing to do with the fact that I was on my way to becoming gay. It's, there was never a conversation about sex anywhere. And okay, that was the 50s and the early 60s, and the world has changed so much. But what, one of the things that amazed me about my years of teach, when I finally got to the point where I was able to teach courses on sexuality and LGBT experience is that in my undergraduate courses, like in the last 15 years, there would always be a point in the class where it became appropriate to have this very personal discussion about what was your experience of sex education like? And it's just extraordinary that even in the early 21st century, almost none of my students in this public university had ever actually had the opportunity to have conversations about sex and what they feel and what's, what, what they desire, what their body is saying to them. And I, don't, I, I have no idea how that's going to change, but it has to change because we all live with this ingrained inability almost to be able to speak about these deeply personal things. And I will say that's one of the things I love about Amber, that she refuses not to speak about it. <laughs> Carrie? Sorry. Yeah, tonight there's been so much, uh, so much of the theme of the evening is honoring and recognizing and appreciating you for your constancy and commitment to certain principles and values, to your left politics, to your, your sexual uh, radicalism, to constant values and core commitments and core identities. And I think what's different tonight that you bring to the room today is the fact that you're 72. So at, at the view from the 72nd floor is very different from the view from the 17th floor, right? <laughs> so how does that perspective of being 72 and looking at that landscape of your prior lifetime, lifelong commitments change? How does, how does age as a variable impact or affect your thinking? Uh, yeah, uh, you know, actually it, um, I thought about it um, when I began to do aging work um, because it was a, 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 a time, it was one of the first times in a while where nobody talked about sex when you were talking about queer aging. 
It was just not a part of the conversation. And, and people would look at me like, what is your problem? You know, I mean, why are you bringing this up? You know, either we have partners or we don't. So, really? Uh, uh, <laughs> that's hopeful. Um, <laughs> And it, it, you know, it was it, but it was brutal because it really it meant that there was no willingness to take on issues of desire and how it changes through time, or how it changes because of what you can do and what you can't do. I mean, I can't do the thing much as I sometimes still wish I could. I can't do the same things in the same way as I could do them at other periods of my life. And if I, if I can't have a conversation about that, I mean, it's one of the reasons that I often, as a younger person, longed for knowing older femmes, because I wanted to ask them, well, what do you do when you're 70? Like, how do you, do, how do you wear a negligee at 70 that isn't trying to look like you're 17 or 32. How is it? Do you do it? Do you not do it? Do you, does it matter? Is it still something you want? I mean, those are not, those are serious questions. And when I first started the Queer Aging Project in Chicago and held the first, I think it was the first event of that project at Howard Brown, and people were very resistant about me doing that. We had like 90 people show up, and it, they'd never had more than 10 or 11 ever come to anything that was for queer aging. It's like, okay, you know, do you really want to get real here or not? You want to know about sexuality when you're in a nursing home? and they don't, and you're coming out because you live in that nursing home with your wife and she died, and it's the final shot you've got at being a gay man. I mean, that's real, and that's not frivolous. And so I feel like aging has shifted how I feel about sexuality, and, but not its importance. I've been with the same person, the love of my life, Jennifer Levin, for 21 years, and I feel completely lucky to have that relationship, but I don't know which of us will survive each other and what that will mean that we'll be looking at for our future. And I feel like the ima to imagine a sexless world as an old person makes me want to kill myself right now. Because I, you know, like when I did work in a nursing home, I found out from one of the social workers that they had a secret club that had started at this nursing home um, of people that wanted to remain sexual. And it was very, very considered very dangerous to even tell me about this is when I was out doing work around aging. And I said, well, what does that mean to remain sexual? And she said, well, we kind of don't care what the definition of that is. Sometimes it's like bringing magazines that are sexually explicit or having somebody come in that's a dancer or talking telling each other stories about what we used to do, or what, I mean, it, that's what it meant. But we wanted to not give that up in ourselves. And we found that other people didn't want to either at this nursing home, but we have to keep it a secret because they'd kick us out. That's what I think the future looks like when we refuse to talk about it around aging. I don't know what my own physical life is going to be like in terms of desire, but I know I have it. And I really am never prepared to give it up for anybody else.
Amber, we're so honored and so happy to be able to give you this award. Um, thank you for all your words and for your continued vision. Um, come up here and uh, accept this honor for us. Thank you.